Good morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Blessed be God forever. We gather in the presence of our God. May our prayers be heard, and may God's word give us strength. Please pray with me. Generous Father, you have given us hearts to love, breath to live, and spirit to sing. You have gathered us into a community of care and worship. Let us worship you now with love, thanksgiving, and praise for the many treasures you have given us. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who, all who love him, who confess and earnestly repent of their sin, and who seeks to store up the treasures in heaven. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Gracious Father, we bring nothing to this table world, and take nothing out of it. Yet we yearn for the riches of humanity. We admit that in our desire for more, we fall into temptation and find ourselves trapped by harmful desires. We eagerly store up earthly treasures only to find our faith increasingly hollow and unsatisfying. We dismiss those who might be speaking for you, but in our minds are not old enough, are not educated enough, not refined enough, or just not enough like us. Teach us to see others through your eyes and to be rich in good works and generosity on their behalf. Teach us to store up treasures of righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness so that we may keep hold of the internal life you offer us. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
seated. Ministries of our church, um, I'd like to draw your attention in your bulletins, please, to page 10 and 11. Our church is right now in the middle of collecting a bunch of donations for back to school bags. And on page 11, if you'll see about three or four paragraphs down, there's a list of the items that are needed. These are all over Walmart right now, really good prices. They need pencils, pens, pencil boxes, notebooks, backpacks, erasers, markers, crayons, folders, binders, highlighters, rulers, scissors, calculators, basically anything you could find in the school they've got there right now for a good deal. Um, and we're collecting those, I think, at both entrances. Is that right? Definitely here, I think, at both entrances. So if you just get a few things, bring them in, put them in the mail box, or the uh, laundry baskets on either side, and we'll be happy to collect those to give to the kids then when it's closer for school to start. Um, at this time, we'd like to ask Ms. Sarah Jones to join us and Mrs. Tanya Zahn for our scholarship awarding. Sarah, on behalf of the Christian Education Committee, we would like to award you the Mabel Clark Scholarships and the J. Annette Mitchell Scholarships. Um, Sarah's been a part of this church almost her whole life, I'm assuming. And to get the Mabel Clark Scholarship, she was in attendance. Um, at minimum, she was here more than two-thirds of every Sunday for Sunday school as well as church from her ninth grade year through her 12th grade year. So that's a large accomplishment. And we're very proud of Sarah, and we wish her all the best at Duquesne and look forward to seeing her when she's home. Thank you. Let us pray now. Generous God, in this world we are often blind to the treasures you've placed right under our noses. Instead of seeking first the kingdom of God, we seek our own safety, comfort, and security, and think these are found in money or possessions or recreation. We pray for your forgiveness and a second chance at reordering our priorities. We lift up those murder victims at home and abroad who have died because of their faith in you or because they were born a certain race or simply because they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. May they be embraced by the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. And Lord, we lift up to those who perpetrated these deaths as well as all who mourn the losses and struggle to find some comfort, hope, and peace in the midst of their tragedy. Loving God, we are a people that long to see your face. At a time when many question the relevance of the church, give us the presence to be witnesses in the world, witnesses that strengthen the loving presence of you in this community. Help us to be the answer to those questions of relevance by what we do and how we love. Alone, we can do nothing, but with you, all things are possible. Show to us the causes of violence which exist in the world around us. Give us the courage to respond to them through the service of others and according to your divine will. Comfort us but do not shield us from your call to be instruments of peace and keep us mindful of seeking your kingdom here on earth that we may grab hold of the eternal life you promise us. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would all like to join me in the prayer of illumination. 
Lord, open our hearts and minds by the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that as the scriptures are read and the words proclaimed, we may receive with fresh ears and open hearts the message you have for us today. Amen. I will be reading Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your or life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. second reading for today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you're following along in your Bibles, um, I don't actually want to start at verse 13. I want to start at 11. Um, that's a misprint in the bulletin. Starts out, but you, this is Paul's charge to Timothy. He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now would the children like to come down front? Good morning, guys. <laughs> I have up here for you. Actually, Cash brought it in for me to help me today with our little lesson. And what do you think it is? A Lego piggy bank. And Cash actually built this Lego piggy bank. And uh, who else has a piggy bank at their house? Do you have one? Yeah? All right. You have one? I have one, too. Mine's a little box. It's not a little piggy, huh? Yeah, and what do you guys do with your piggy banks? What are they for? They're for money, to keep your money, to hold your money. And it's a good way to help save your money and uh, so you don't lose your money. And uh, maybe it'll help you save your money if you want to buy a special toy at the store. Is that what you're saving your money for? Yeah, you want to save your money for a special toy? Maybe it helps you save money for a gift for somebody that you like. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you might need a pretty big piggy bank for, for college, huh? Yeah. Well, today in our Bible reading, we read that in a story that Jesus was giving, he was telling some people about a man who had some barns. 
and his barns got so full of all the grain that he had, and he had extra grain. And did anybody hear in the story? What did he do when his barn was so full and had so much extra grain, he didn't know where to put it? That's right, he tore down his barn and he built bigger barns to put all of this grain, all those goods in it. And then he said, well, I don't have to do too much. I can just be happy with all my, my big barns and all my stuff. And what, what was Jesus like? What did he think about that? Do you think that made him happy? No, it didn't make him happy. Why don't you think that made Jesus happy? Well, yeah, and, and he wanted them to pay attention because he wanted to say that didn't make him happy that he was just keeping all of his stuff to himself. He wasn't sharing any of it. Now, it's good to have some things, and it's good to save, like money in our piggy bank, right? But it's also good to share. And the man in our story, though he had so much, he didn't share any of it. And at the time when Jesus was telling this story, there were people that were really hungry. There were people who had a very, very hard life. But this man in the story just didn't share any of his goodness that God has given him. And Jesus is trying to tell each one of us that we should share of the goodness that God has given us, right? Is sharing easy to do all the time? No, sometimes it's really hard to share. But I'll give you a little hint. The more you share, the easier it gets. Are you guys ready to practice sharing? You ready to practice sharing? Because I brought, I brought something for you guys to share. Okay, in this bag, I have for you guys two gold chocolate coins. All right. And what I want you to do, is so I'm going to give you two coins. I want you to keep one coin for yourself, right? Because it's good to save and it's good to have some things. But with your extra coin, I want you guys to find somebody in here to go and share your coin, extra gold chocolate coin with. I'm going to let you guys pick. And I want you to try to find somebody who's not a family member, not mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, maybe somebody you don't know, and share your coin with. And when you share it, you can share it with a smile and just say, I want to give this to you. I want to bless you. I, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. You think you guys are ready to try that? Okay, well, before we do, let's say a little prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you in the abundance when we have a lot. We thank you when we have just a little. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to be happy and good and thankful givers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, here are your two coins. Keep one for yourself. You can give the other to somebody else. Or if you guys are feeling really giving, you can give two coins to somebody. I'll let you pick. And then when you're done, you can come on up and come with uh, Miss Pandy to your class. Okay. You sure can. can you? All right. Okay. I'll let you go find someone to share your gold coins with. Here you go, Ella. All right. Okay. There you go. Go find someone to share with. Wow, Shannon, you just kind of did the sermon for me. Thanks. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. How many people got a gold coin? All right, so everybody shared at least one of their coins. That's good news. That's good news. All right, good morning. <laughs> I have two promises I can make you today. One of them is that this sermon is not terribly long because we just got back from South Carolina in the wee hours of the morning Saturday, and I, I'm tired. And the second promise is I'm probably going to leave you with more questions than answers, so <laughs> enjoy. Um, I want to start off with sharing a little story, something that happened to me a few weeks ago. I was sitting in the Chinese restaurant. If you know where the Chinese restaurant is in town, it's right across the street from Shady Park. 
And I happened to be sitting in a booth where I could look out through the windows and I saw something a little odd. I saw some people kind of in groups, but not in groups, and just kind of wandering through the park. And I was like, well, this is interesting. And since it's buffet, you can go as many times as you want. So I went a few times while I was watching these people. And I was looking and I thought, okay, they are in groups, but they're not really talking to each other. And like, they're kind of loosely together, but they're all doing this. And so I was very intrigued by this. <laughs> so I, I kind of, I didn't have any answers. I, I saw that all kind of happening. And I did notice that most of them were young. Not all of them, but most of them were pretty young in the park. So I thought, well, this is an interesting occurrence. I will ask my experts on phones, which would be my youth group, the next time I see them about this. Um, before I could even see them, though, that, or the next night, I guess, I was coming back from Erie. I take marathon trips to Erie when I go shopping. So it was about 12.30 at night when I was coming into town. And lo and behold, there are groups of people, the same thing. It wasn't the middle of the day anymore. It was almost the middle of the night. And they're still in the park and walking around like this. And I thought, all right, this is just bizarre. So does anybody know what I'm talking about yet? Have experienced this phenomenon? Yeah, oh yeah, there's some hands. Yeah, okay, so then we met for youth group on that Wednesday. And I said, all right, guys, explain something to me. What's with all the people in the park? And they're like, oh, they're playing Pokemon. And I was like, OK, that doesn't help me a whole lot. Because <laughs> my knowledge of Pokemon, it's on the front of your bulletin if you got a chance to look at it. My knowledge of Pokemon is it started around 1995, so I was 15. And it was a video game that we played in our houses, in our living rooms, in the comfort of our own homes. And it wasn't something you went out in a park with a group at 1230 at night and wandered around. So I said, okay, you gotta explain this to me a little bit more. Well, long and short, it took a while to explain to me, but I kinda got the idea. Long and short of it is this. On their phones, there's a game now called Pokemon Go that just came out at the beginning of July. And this game allows you to, you have an app that you put on your phone, and it allows you to, through the camera feature, look for Pokemon characters in real life. <laughs> This is so strange. So you have like the camera feature up, and I might have the camera on Evelyn sitting here, but on my phone, I see a little Pokemon creature sitting next to her on the pew. It's so strange. And so I'm like, this, that was just blowing my mind. I, maybe you guys are used to this stuff. I, this was blowing my mind. I'm like, uh, what, what, are, what, I don't understand. And they're like, well, yeah. And then when you see the creature, you throw a little ball at it, and then you capture it. And I said, why? <laughs> And I said, well, because then you get more and you capture them and you make them train at the gym and they get stronger and then you have battles and then they win the battles. And I said, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Why? Because <laughs> it's fun. Apparently that didn't register with my brain, but they thought it was fun. So I said, well, how many of these things are there? It turns out there are at least 150 of these characters that you can capture and train in existence. And little did you know, but they, I caught one out in our parking lot right out there. I don't know the name of it, but I caught it. <laughs> I threw my ball and I caught it on my phone. But there's 151 of these things. And you can go around and collect them. And because I'm a visual person, um, I, I, I collected a few of the actual like figurines of these things. So uh, this is only like 20 or so of them. But these are the little, little things that we're talking about. Like this is a little green guy with arms and a leg and a hat. Put him right there. And we have, I don't know, this pink one looks kind of kind of creepy. She's got big triangle ears. We'll put her right there. So we got all these little Pokemon characters. And I'm just going to kind of throw them out here. Meanwhile, there's kids salivating out in the pews right now. All right, so these are the little characters. Now, I look at that and I think, that's just a bunch of little creatures. But to somebody, these are treasures. And they're so much so treasures that people will leave their houses to play video games outside, whether it's noon or midnight, to capture these little things. Treasures. To me, I see things. I see little things that are going to get caught in my vacuum cleaner very soon. And I'm going to have to throw them away then. But to somebody, these are treasures. These things are treasures. All right, well, this kind of all got me thinking about, like, what are treasures? Well, I would certainly never get up in the middle of the night and go to the park with my phone and try to capture these little creatures that don't really exist. It's just not something I would do for fun. Other people would. But we have these weird kind of things, don't we? Think about some of the collections that we have. Rock collections. 
rock collection. Some people collect rocks. They're rocks. They're different sizes, different colors. They're heavy. If you move to another house, you got to pack up your rocks and take them with you. But people have them. Doesn't make sense to me. Um, what else? I collect books. I don't mean to, but I do. I just, there's just a magnet. They attract to me, and suddenly it's time to move, and we have boxes and boxes of books that have to go somewhere. Um, these things are things that actually mean something to us, though. And as we think about it, you know, when, when we're younger, maybe it's toys and games and things like that that are treasures for us, excuse me. As we get older, it might change into other things, um, stamp collections, rock collections. But really, as you become an adult and you start seeing the real world and you realize that there aren't little Pokemon creatures out and around and that you have to somehow earn a paycheck so that you can bring home some food and keep a good roof over your kid's head. And those kids seem to want to have shoes and clothes and go to school. And then they want to collect little Pokemon creatures. You start realizing that there are other things that you treasure now more than maybe you treasured when you were young. And some of those things, of course, are things like money or possessions or land or power. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are negative in and of themselves. They're necessary, and they're things that are good for us in moderation, and they're things that God wants us to have. He wants us to be fed. He wants us to also feed others. And as Shannon illustrated in her sermon, we have two gold coins that God gives us, and God wants us to at least give one of those gold coins to someone else. It's a treasure, but you realize that the real treasure is in sharing it, and it takes a different kind of mindset. Um, I'd like, if you have your Bibles with you, or if not, there's some in the pew, or if not, you just want to listen, that's fine. I'd like to go back to that parable of the rich full. It, um, it's Luke chapter 12, starts at verse 13. I'd like to read it just one more time, because this is really good stuff in here. It, to kind of set the stage, too, for this, this isn't a conversation that's happening, like, on the road, just between Jesus and this rich fool guy, or this, um, the man that comes up to ask about the inheritance. This is happening with, it says a little bit earlier in the chapter, it's a crowd of many thousands who had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, and Jesus began to speak first to his disciple. So this is like a major crowd, okay? This is a lot of people. And Jesus is talking to the disciples, and then he's talking to the crowd. And he's not just talking about the weather. He's talking about um, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, will, God will also acknowledge him before angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. Um, he says, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you'll defend yourselves or what you'll say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. This is some heavy stuff. Okay? He's really imparting some of his greatest treasure, some of his greatest wisdom to this huge crowd that's gathered. Picture this. All right, picture this. Pretend you are the man that now comes up and says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> Can you imagine being Jesus at this point? You're having this huge sermon talking to crowds of people. They're trampling each other. They're listening to you. you know, they're, they're really finally listening to what you're saying. And this man walks up and says, hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And this is one of the reasons I love Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't just say, okay, Sorry, everybody, just a second, we got something to take care of, and take the man over and divide. No, no, no. Jesus turns, and he says to him, I love this, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? In other words, he says, hey, who made me the judge? To which if I was the man, if I wasn't completely shell-shocked and not answering, I'd say, well, don't you make you the judge? <laughs> I mean, you kind of are the, you know, God. But he doesn't say that. He just says, hey, who made me the judge? And I think the reason, and, and again, I'm trying to read Jesus' mind and probably getting this totally wrong, but I would think that the reason he's saying that is because in his head, he's thinking, listen, this guy is focused on the money. I've got, got to get the focus back up. He wants the focus to stop being on this kind of treasure and on this treasure, the treasure between the relationship between man and God. So Jesus doesn't even enter into the inheritance discussion. Now, if you put yourself in the shoes of the man who has just interrupted Jesus, asked him to divide the inheritance, 
been kind of shut down real quickly, saying, who made me the judge? Pretend you're now still this man listening to what he says next. He says to them, so now, the guy's still standing there. Now he turns to the crowd and he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What do you feel like now if you're the man standing there? <sighs> not great, I wouldn't think. I think this would be kind of an awkward situation because basically, Jesus has just called you out as being a greedy person who wants an abundance of possession. To me, when I first read this story, I got a little mad at Jesus. I'll be, I'll be honest. I was a little bit like, he's not doing anything wrong. I mean, he sees Jesus as like the God and, you know, he's judge of all, so it would make sense to ask him to judge about this inheritance thing. I, I kind of couldn't blame the guy when I first read it, but then as I thought about it and I kind of let it kind of soak into my brain, I thought, no, this does make sense. Because the man's focus is on the money. It's not a bad reason to be focused on money. It's not a bad thing to be trying to decide how to divide an inheritance. That's, that in and of itself is not the bad thing, but it's not the thing. It's not the treasure that we are to have. Then he goes on and tells this parable. I love this. It still, I mean, I, I picture the guy still standing there kind of awkwardly, kind of put down like, okay, I get the point, Jesus, can I go sit down now? But he's still standing there for this parable. He says, um, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Again, <laughs> standing there listening to that parable, here's another situation where a man happens to have a bumper crop. He's got a lot of crop. He's got to do something with all this crop that's come in that year. What does he do? Well, he builds the bigger barn so that he can store it. And then once he stores it, he sits back and says, all right, I've arrived. I'm retiring, let's go to Cancun, right? In our minds, there's nothing wrong with this. But if you look at it from God's perspective of what's most important, the treasure that's most important here is not here. It's not between the man and those crops, it's here. And if the man's looking to pursue God's treasure, he's not looking from one man to the next. He's not looking at this crop Ooh, I got a great crop. Good, I'll big bigger barns. No, no. If he's looking this way, what he does is says, okay, I have enough to live. I have enough to get by pretty well. Who can I give these crops to? Instead of barns, where can I take these crops and give them to someone else? If I have two gold coins, where am I going to take the other good gold coin? That is what God's asking us to pursue. That is the treasure that we're to be looking for here. And so when we hear this story, again, think about it. All right, how many people have been to Disney World before? Just to show you. All right, okay. I went, I was eight or nine, I don't remember a whole lot. But anyhow, at Disney World, I think they still have this, you can trade your money in for what are called Disney dollars, which are a cute little currency that have, like, I think Mickey Mouse on them, and you can trade them in for five Disney dollars or ten, I don't know. Anyhow, you get these Disney dollars, and where you go in Disney World, you can spend them, and you get change back in Disney change, and, and it's all fun and games, but guess what? Once you walk outside of Disney World and go to Kohl's, because you need a new pair of shoes, they're not going to take your Disney dollars. <laughs> That's not going to do you any good there anymore. Or another one, how many of you have had the misfortune of going to Chuck E. Cheese for a child's birthday party? <laughs> yes, my sympathies. Yeah, Chuck E. Cheese, you get these tokens. And you can use the tokens in the games. And then when you win the game, you get these tickets. And you go take the tickets and you give them like a thousand and you get a, an eraser. It's crazy. But then you go outside of Chuck E. Cheese, nobody wants your tokens. Your tokens aren't gonna, your tickets are not gonna get you even a little eraser at Walmart. They don't, it's not worth anything. And God's saying, hey, get your mind off of this. Get your mind on this. This very night, I'm gonna take your soul. This very night, you're going into eternal life. What are you gonna do? You have all these crops. What good is that doing you? You can't take that up with you. 
So when you're on heaven, you've got to keep that perspective here rather than here. We don't want Disney dollars when you get to heaven. What's that? Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. It kind of sounds like he does. This is taken that night. I don't know. All right, very quickly. I did say this wouldn't be long, didn't I? I apologize. I'll get going. All right, very quickly, I want to go then to um, the first Timothy chapter 6 verse that I read. And I, I needed to back us up to verse 11 and 12 because that's kind of the crux of the sermon. But he says that you, this is now Paul talking to Timothy. He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So that is what we're to be pursuing. We're not pursuing these things. These are fun, these are cute, and I'm betting that there's a boy in a red t-shirt back there who'd like to get these off me when I'm all done talking. These things are things. They're fun, they're fun to collect, they're kind of a novelty to look at. But imagine instead if this is righteousness we're putting in or godliness, or endurance, love, faith, I think you get the idea. And the hard part is when you want to be collecting these things, or you want to be collecting that bumper crop and building a bigger barn for it. The hard thing to remember is that it's only these treasures Righteousness, godliness, love, endurance, faith. It's only those treasures that are going to get you here versus here. Pray with me, please. Father God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for your many, many blessings and your many treasures. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to keep our minds and our hearts focused on you and your kingdom as the only thing that matters. In this we pray, amen.
In the name and spirit of Jesus, let us commit it ourselves to being good stewards of the gift entrusted to us, sharing our time, our talent, our material, and spiritual gifts as outward signs of the treasure we hold in Jesus. It's with a grateful heart and a generous spirit that we dedicate these gifts to you, Lord. In your name, amen.
borrowing from Paul's charge to Timothy. I charge you, but you men and women of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.